Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming here and uh, being with us this very special evening. Uh, my name is Nerit Nelson. I'm the Senior Curator of Contemporary Art at the Israel Museum. And I would like to call upon Tami Manor Friedman, Chief Curators of the Arts Wing. Tami. Welcome, everyone. We gather here today for a special occasion a moment that bridges the creative minds behind an extraordinary exhibition. And it is my pleasure to introduce the artists and curators who have made Thomas Demand the starter of history happen. We are privileged to host the artists whose vision and skill resulted in this powerful, thought-provoking artworks. Thomas Demand is considered one of the most in innovative artists of his generation. Born in 1964 in Munich and active in Berlin and Los Angeles, Demand has changed our perception of reality and essentially and especially of current events, though through his uh, use of photography as a multi-faced process. He begins with a photographic image taken from the media, usually related to a political event, which he translates into a life-size model made of paper and cardboard. Once the models have been photographed, they are destroyed. His images are pure and bare of any human presence. They look convincingly real, yet they arouse a slightly unsettling feeling. The Stutter of History was created by, by Douglas Fogel, an independent curator and writer based in Los Angeles. Douglas Fogel has held curatorial positions at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, and the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. And he has also contributed essays to numerous artist monographs. The exhibition that opens here tonight, which is on a global tour, Shanghai, Paris, Jerusalem, and Houston, was curated by Fogel to emphasize the capacity of images to influence and to shape memory. He has drawn connections between Demand's work and art history, seeing him as an heir to Marcel Duchamp and Andy Warhol, who were known for their fascination with everyday objects and media stereotypes. Working with Thomas Demand and Douglas Fogel on behalf of the Israel Museum is Nirit Nelson. Nirit has taught contemporary art and curatorial practice at the Bezalel Academy in Jerusalem for more than 20 years, in addition to her own extensive work as a curator and an art advisor. Most significantly for us, she recently became Landau Family Senior Curator of Contemporary Art here at the Israel Museum. The Stutter of History was in fact the first major project to greet her on her arrival. Naturally, Nirit was delighted by this and she has worked tirelessly together with associate curator Orly Rabi to meet the challenge of mounting such an important and complex show in a way that would bring our wide Israeli public to appreciate the work of Thomas Demand. Earlier this year, during a planning visit at the museum, the artist was kind enough to speak to an intimate group of staff and art lovers when Nirit interviewed him in our patron's lounge. Highlights of their conversation are presented in English, Hebrew, and Arabic, in the leaflet accompanying uh, the exhibition. But now we have the opportunity for an expanded dialogue, or rather three-part conversation. And I look forward to the insights it will provide a fitting prologue just before we go up to enjoy the exhibition. Please join me in welcoming Thomas, Dallas, and Nirit to the stage.
So, I would like to thank both Thomas Demand and Douglas Fogel for this really fruitful collaboration. It's like I'm saying, for me it doesn't matter what happens in China, Paris, or Paris, France, or in the United States, Houston, Israel is most important. So, <laughs> so I want um, to start with an interesting quote. Um, how do I get that? Can I get it? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, nowadays, anyone who wishes to combat lies and to write the truth must overcome at least five difficulties. You must have the courage to write the truth when truth is everywhere opposed, the keenness to recognize it, although it is everywhere concealed, the skill to manipulate it as a weapon, the judgment to select those in whose hands it will be effective, and the cunning uh, to spread the truth among such persons. If you couldn't follow, it's out here. These five musts for bringing out the truth uh, were written by Bertolt Brecht in 1935. Aside from this style, which is from another era, can you address, Thomas, how these points resonate with your works assembled by Douglas under the category of uncanny histories? Um, so, yeah, that's big shoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, I am not a journalist. I don't decide what is true and what is not true. I'm maneuvering through, let's say, let's call it a landscape, and the landscape is full of pictures of our world. Right. And we all share that landscape, we all have been there, we see it all the time. It represents the world, mostly with photographic images, sometimes with stories. <clears throat> but it's very hard to, uh, you know, to navigate through that and to know how much we are manipulated. Yeah. And my, would say, hope, or like at least my attempt, would be just to look long enough um, to see what's actually on the picture. And maybe by doing that, and then fabricating a version of that picture which is more like a pale memory of the real picture, which might have you know, a past which we, as I said, like don't really, we can't really ch check anymore. Right. That, uh, that another another version of the of the of the image comes out, <clears throat> which doesn't rely so much on anecdotal or factual matter, and uh, but more on a filtered version of a, a, a participational kind of memory we all have, and so um, and it's at the same time it should be so constructed and it should be so clear that this is a fabrication um, that it sometimes I, I I compare it with like the 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 idea of a writer and that's bringing me back back to Brecht, uh, yeah. back to Brecht a writer who writes but as I said not as a journalist right <clears throat> so you have a if Nabokov writes about his youth um, in Memory Speak which is was which is a wonderful book I recommend everybody to read. Yeah. Um, he, he writes about everything, he writes down everything he remembers yeah. and tries to make a, a picture of his youth out of, it, out of it. But even if he could, he's not tracing it down. He doesn't feel obliged to kind of go and find out whether the Uncle Piotr was really called Uncle Pot Piotr, right. but maybe he was Uncle Carol or something. And that's the way um, how, we mem how memory kind of plays tricks, but also is able to kind of create another uh, notion of who we are, what our memories are, and what they do for us now. So uh, my truth is not so much the truth of a reporter, but more the truth of, a, um, of an author. And I'm happy to admit that, and I think the work admits it itself all the time. Right. Um, and in German, we have two words for that. One is uh, Wahrheit and the other one is Wahrhaftigkeit. Yeah. And so the author would always claim Wahrhaftigkeit for himself. You would know if it's a badly written book or if it's kind of too 
contrived or whether it doesn't really kind of um, uh, isn't really based on personal experiences. <clears throat> you you trust the you have to trust the author, right? But you don't trust him to tell you necessarily a story which which like a historian does, which brings us to the title, I guess. Yeah. Uh, we will get to the title. I'm just relating to what you said in relation to Brecht, because Brecht used to have this uh, hobby of cutting out images from the newspapers and without the captions. So people will not know how to relate exactly to the event and to mesh them, to mix them. And writing, like you said, to fabricate something that is uh, and going out of there to a different journey, to a different understanding. So before, um, okay, we'll, we'll go first to, to the title. So Douglas, can you tell us, how did you come up with this amazing title that we are all in love with, the Stator of History? Thank you, and, and Neri, thank you for everything and everybody uh, at the museum. It's been amazing to work with you guys on this project. The title, as Thomas knows, um, I came up with it, I don't remember when, but when I was, maybe when I was writing the essay before that even, when we were talking about the possibility of doing an exhibition. Um, and I remember, speaking of memory, I had a memory of having read it in a book by Grail Marcus called Lipstick Traces, which is about the, com the connection between punk rock situationism and, um, and uh, subcultures in post-war Britain and, uh, and Europe. And I can't find it. So I don't know. <laughs> and then I thought, OK, so then it must be from like Benjamin yeah. Walter Benjamin or something. And I thought, I can't find it. Right. So I'm not sure if I came up with it just on my own. But the idea of the, of the stutter of history, um, which is funny because it's dealing with images instead of words and stuttering is a verbal phenomenon um, that you study over but stutter over a word but the idea had came from thinking about Thomas's work um, and Thomas and I have known each other a really long time Thomas was in my first exhibition that I ever curated on my own my first solo project in 1998 um, and his practice um, of taking an image recreating it, as a three-dimensional object, but out of paper and cardboard, re-photographing it, printing it, putting it behind a sandwich of plexiglass so that it becomes this object-like thing in the gallery, and not just simply a photograph, but a sculpture in a sense, um, taking up physical space and uh, your own kind of space in terms of its dimensionality. This kind of process of going from the real world, a, a world that we mediate by images anyways all the time, um, there's a kind of break between each of the images. When you look in the exhibition and you look and stand in front of Thomas's work, there is a phenomenological, a physical kind of like stutter. You look at the work from afar, you see it as what you think is potentially a real thing, and you come up and there's an uncanny kind of quality to it based on this fragility of the object that he made in his studio, created momentarily, from an image and then photographed and then destroyed the, the actual physical model. So the stuttering has to do with that, but also there's a stutter be between two different kinds of history. History is not simply history with a capital H, uh, momentous events, things right. that are in the history books. History is the small occurrences every day that we live through that we think of as memory, I guess, our own memories. But that's another kind of history, history with a small h. And there's images that we think of as iconic historical images, um, which could be anything in politics from you know, the, the film, the Zapruder film of Kennedy assassination to so on and so forth. You know? yeah. And then on the other hand, um, images that are banal, kind of more everyday, but might have incredible significance, but you don't really quite know what you're looking at without knowing more about it. And that's kind of that break between those two types of things is another kind of version of that stutter. Right. So, but I mean, it's really predicated on the idea that history is storytelling, is done with images, and that Thomas kind of looks at that from above as a, a process or a structure in the world. Right. Sam, can we get 
the other and continue with that so we will see the and the other one just the catalog okay now um, now you can move to the next one for Thomas news items are by nature ephemeral and fleeting yet you single out events from the past sometimes from the depths of historical oblivion like in the case of Lenny Riefenstahl and ca cast light on them showing them to be still significant and troubling uh, today. What leads you to sense that the political, social, or mundane moment will remain relevant through the years? Well, if I would know that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it has a lot of intuition, but it's also yeah. like I'm a member of that tour bus, on the tour bus of that driving through the landscape. So things which I find interesting or like which I don't really understand, and, and also, I, one has to say that everything I say here is, of course, in retrospect and makes sense. But like when you when you work on something, you don't really you just have a clue that it might work or something, but you don't know whether what it actually means. That's the whole point right. of making the work, in fact. So I can't really answer that. But you have I, I I usually work with like search patterns, which I have you know like in the back of my mind for a long time, and then. I, ha I hate to kind of quote Picasso on this, but <laughs> you know it when you see it. You just, you go, right. you know, it comes to you and you just, um, uh, you didn't know that you were looking for exactly that, but it matches all the, all the uh, ca characteristics you had in your, in your box full of search patterns for right. a certain work or something. For instance, this one came from basically from Agnes Martin. It didn't have right. anything to do with um, also an old lady, but that's the only common thing I would right. say. Um, but, but it's it not only <coughs> visual, right? It's also literature and, po I mean. Yeah, but it's, you know, like it's not even that poignant. It's just more, I look at pictures, of course. And yeah. But it, you know, like one of the things was like the pop art, the, and that doesn't have anything to do with Agnes Martin again, right. likes the a repetition of the same object. Mm -hmm. And while, you know, famous, it's, everybody knows that has to do with the fact that the West, Western uh, capitalism um, has full shelves of goods to buy, and whereas this, you know, communism had empty sh shelves, right. and that was that was the point to be proven. And so I like the fact that you just, you know, there's something of like a calmness coming from a picture with many same objects. Right. Even the screen over there, or like the, which which is is above the the he headphones. Right. You know, you have like 60 broken plates, but right. somehow even. Even broken plates can give a sense of calmness That's because true. you have plenty of them. And mm -hmm. so that was one of the search patterns which I was kind of keep, keeping in mind when I was browsing through the book because it was, was always interesting for me. Uh, René Liefenstahl is like, uh, of course, it's part of the grammar um, of, you know, the German, Im you know, kind of library of images, but it's, it's the department of the forbidden images. Right. So, of course, you would like to you know, what's forbidden exactly here. You would like to know what's in the boxes. Absolutely. And then, but it came from this pop art thing. Um, and, the, and the pop art thing at the same time, it does have nothing to do with the René Liefenstahl. The pop art thing was, you know, Brillo boxes. Right. Um, but so you have boxes and you need, you know, if, you, if they're plain boxes, then it becomes too... It becomes a lame, not very specific image, which doesn't have any magic in itself, or like doesn't carry any possibility. It's just like the boxes, and everybody has seen them all over the place. So I was looking for boxes which are kind of more specific, right. or something. And that, and the way, that's when the archive came into mind, because these boxes could be pizza boxes, but they could be also film boxes. Right. And of course, they are film boxes. No, nobody would have that many pizzas in shelves. Yeah. <laughs> But and without a logo. <clears throat> but it's not that I, it's only yeah. film boxes. You know, the yeah. round ones, I could have done those as well, but that right. would have been only the film boxes. Right. So, in a sense, you know, it needs to have some ambivalence and some openness to be interesting and to, to also ha live on its own without right. me telling people, look at this, you know. So, right. um, but that's kind of, you know, it's a very chaotic way, genesis of like, you know, this is interesting and this is interesting and things don't have anything to do with each other. And they end up as one image in the end. Right. Can I follow up? I'm, I'm yes, curious. Go ahead. I'm curious. Then, Thomas, do you have? Um, you know, we've written labels, and everyone can read some information about these. 
Is your we, 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 you wrote sorry, that? Sorry, I wrote yes. that. Yes, <laughs> the, the royal we. Yes, I wrote that. But my question about that is that, um, and we've talked about it a little bit before, but I'm curious for the audience: Do you care if people read the label and know the content? How, you're your ruining idea? one of my questions, Douglas. Right now. What's the fuck? No, no, you're allowed. Battle of the curators. We have right here on the stage. You did not. You're allowed. You're allowed. I didn't see the questions beforehand. Yeah. But I just wanted to kind of keep the conversation going based on that because I'm curious, who's your ideal viewer? Is it the one, the audience here reading my labels, or, <laughs> or is it that is it the person walking in and not reading the labels? Well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, um, I, I grew up in museums and I love museums, mm -hmm. and the idea and the archive is the right uh, picture for that. The idea of a museum is not only to have artifacts. It's right. also to um, agglomerate knowledge about the artifacts, uh, to have like a certain expertise, maybe even do research on things, if it's an archaeological museum, for instance. Or, you know, like, it's a place where the information about things is available. Because if, a, if you go to a museum and you see an old king and it's, his name is Charles V, you know, somehow you would like to know who was that and did he really kind of remotely look like that guy, which we don't know because we didn't have photography at the time. But, you know, who was a painter? What is the time when it kind of was painted? And we know that this information is available. We don't really say, if you don't read the labels, we wouldn't say, oh, my visit to the museum didn't make any sense. It's just the possibility to know, if you want to know, is that is one of the foundations of a museum, and to keep the knowledge as well. Yeah. Another one is, of course, to keep the artifacts out of, you know, the daily uh, uh, destruction, you know, of course, and uh, say, keep them safe, basically. But coming back to the first one, is the the museum is um, providing these contents if you like them, right. and and that is a really important part of it. And my role is then to kind of make a sh and, and they make a, doing an exhibition and come you know coming together with the architecture and uh, and all the elements which kind of in the end make the whole show my role is um, apart from making the pictures is at some point i also have to kind of create a certain curiosity in a viewer right how what is coming around the corner here and what is around that corner you know <laughs> You know what I mean? You said it so convincingly. <laughs> looking for a dog or something. I'm doing this since a while, you see. Someone's cat came <laughs> He's testing if we're listening. But so the curiosity to kind of create a certain curiosity. And that has to, you know, some of the pictures are completely, I don't think anybody would identify. Um, yeah. But others, they are very identifiable. And so if the other one, it's very simple. If the other one is kind of, you know, reflects something I remember, maybe this one does too. And so it builds up, and that's the thing. And of course, I know that pe people kind of don't have the time to read every label. They should, though. Um, <laughs> they're that's very a hint. short. <laughs> that's a hint. But, but of course, the, you know, like, that's the possibility of a museum show, it, I know, you know, versus a gallery show, for instance. Right. So, next question to Thomas. The Swedish uh, Norwegian artist, uh, Hanna Rigen, wove tapestries choosing a strenuous labor-intensive medium to respond to events she read about in the newspapers. For example, one of her works relates to the cruelty of the US Army in North, North Vietnam. You too chose a particularly arduous uh, process, which eventually results in, the in a photograph to respond to a news event. Why this long and industrious process in response to a fleeting event? Well, you know, like one part of the stutter, why the title of the, of the show is good, is, is um, stuttering is a speech impediment. Right. Everybody knows if you want to be a polite listener to somebody who stutters, you don't interrupt him. Which means that it might take a little longer, but he will still finish the sentence. So if, you ta if ta things take a little longer, they might worth like waiting them out. Right. And that's what applies to this one too. You know, it, takes a, it might take a little longer, but it also gives you more time to think about things and like probably you know, reflect on it. But this is, they are not snapshots, that's for sure. Right. And so um, you know, like the detour, the time I spend with the thing, you know, like the other thing is like my, all, everything you see on these pictures or like, I would say like 95% of what you see on the pictures, I have made myself. Right. 
because I don't, I have assistants which I work with, but like their assistants are not supposed to do what I want to do. Right. You know, their assistants are supposed to do the stuff I don't want to do, like accounting. <laughs> and and that is yes. important though, you know, like because like many of the things we see in the art world now are kind of fabricated. And right. I'm not saying that's bad, but this is, I like to fabricate my things because right. I have the best ideas when I work myself. Yeah. I have good ideas when I'm in front of a computer. I have great ideas if I talk to my accountant. But the best ideas I have actually when I work. And so why would, any, why would I let anybody do that? And why would I want to hush into a result right. um, when the thing which gives the most pleasure and probably also the best, I, the best way of thinking um, is actually right in front of me? That's why that's the, that's the retrospect explanation why it takes so long. Right. The, more correct uh, reasoning is because like I make things out of things I can get rid of and I, um, um, I, I I like the fact that they don't they, they don't have a sense of artifice in the sense of like how oh, how did he make the cathedral out of six thousand toothpicks or something right. it never should have that thing because that would right. come in the forefront of anything the picture can actually say by itself but you know, it also should kind of be fascinating. Really, bluntly said, it should be. You should stand there and think, like, wow, this is really somehow crazy. Yeah. Sometimes that work is also very simple. Like there is a work called Hackboard in the show, which right. is admittedly not very complex. Yes. But there is also clearing, which we just saw, which right. is very complex. But Can it's you also show clearing, Sam? Back. <coughs> yeah. That one, for instance. So that took a while, but. I, um, <laughs> how many leaves are on the... How many years? How many leaves did they, you uh, cut out? 270,000. Yeah, well... I read um, the text. <laughs> <laughs> um, Douglas, uh, we, can, we can go forward with the images. Um, since uh, Thomas's work, uh, works are photographs, they present themselves as having to do with certainty. Yet when we contemplate them, they remain enigmatic. How do you understand this tension between certainty and mystery in his works? I find them really uncertain. <laughs> I mean, because <laughs> he's, uh, I mean, this is better answered by him, but from my perspective, um, the uncertainty that you talk about, again, comes into this idea of the stuttering and the way in which, I guess I would call it more the uncanny in the sense right. of, um, the strangely familiar, the something that's familiar but not quite, um, not quite what you think it is or could be. Um, so, I mean, and now I'm really talking about the physicality of the work and the visuality of the work, what you're looking at. Not about the narrative, the content, but that too has a sense of, you know, this was uh, not in my mind the control room, this is called control room, was not necessarily... Um, that kind of image I was talking about, like in the you know the history with the capital H. This is yeah. this was shot. And Thomas, correct me if I'm wrong. This was taken from cell phone images of the workers going in to try to control the reactor uh, at Fukushima after the um, um, tsunami uh, disabled uh, the react the nuclear reactor, and there was a whole story about. Again, you should correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but that the images were then doctored by the company to make the panels all look they, they hadn't fallen down. So talking about order and disorder, and um, in, within the narrative content of this one, there is a backstory about that, about the, uh, <clears throat> the attempt to control an image, to control a political event, a historical event and a political event, through controlling an image um, by uh, editing it in a way. Um, and this one is, you know, and so with Thomas here, you've got this idea of technological certainty, I guess I would call it that, and the idea of control, controlling natural, you know, nature in a sense, right. dangerous kind of thing. And, you know, we don't like to see a nuclear control room that looks shambolic, yeah. you know, like it's falling apart. That doesn't sound like a good thing. So, um, yeah, but I think more generally there is that dance between right. the topic of certainty 
the topic of images and the way in which images are controlled, consumed, produced, disseminated, um, and the, the process that Thomas has as an artist of stepping back from that and getting you to look at the way in which images are used, circulated, um, consumed, remembered, um, as a process, cultural process. Um, so. Great. Uh, for Thomas. A political theorist, Chantal Moff, wrote that if we truly want to imagine the pluralist public sphere, we cannot focus on the individual. You can never uh, really grasp the specificity of the political, which is always a collective identification. Interestingly, in some of your works, you start from an individual, such as Donald Trump. Can I get Donald Trump? Pope John Paul II, or even Henri Matisse, and import them into a public discussion. What does the individual catalyze in your work? Well, with Matisse, I, I, um, I would leave aside because that's a... That it, it's a different story. No, but it's kind of, you know, this is not... It's not the purpose of his uh, effort wasn't to become a brand, right? But Trump is, you know, his effort is to be the president of whatever. Also, <laughs> you I know, believe like, that's his official Maybe was his right? official <laughs> title. <laughs> Whatever. For four and, years, um, and the Pope, in a sense, he knows also that he's representing something which is a much bigger body than himself, and right. so therefore, it, they are um, they becoming fictional figures in themselves, and that's of course the difference to Matisse because he was trying to be an artist and he got right. photographed and everybody was so fascinated by, okay. by um, um, his late years that, they, that the photographs became his brand basically. Right. We have another one which is kind of Jackson Pollock, you right. know, that he, the photographs of like a single photographer on an afternoon made him, uh, but not only him, but also the idea of the artist. Right. Uh, into celebrity. into an icon, yeah. you know, which didn't yeah. have anything to do with reality, right. but it is. It has so much power that it kind of is still alive, and right. so that's why I would leave out Matisse. But you know, with Trump, it's also you know, control room has a certain pun, mm -hmm. the name control room, and then you know, there's that the problem is that they have no control, but they're right. standing in a room for that, and. Um, here we have the. I, I like sometimes I like these simple entry points. I like paper. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> and <laughs> surprise, surprise. And when paper takes a role in 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 our lives, you know, and yeah. in in our also like our communal lives and our you know like not the not individual life. <clears throat> and in this case, this is a photograph I took. Uh, for, um, I took from from his first press conference. Um, after declaring he's running for president, which was yeah. in January, and he would like to, you know, basically circulate the idea that he gives everything to his children, what he has, to kind of not run into a conflict of interest. Of course, we know that was never the case. <coughs> but also we know that all these papers were empty. They were yes. blank sheets. Yeah. Because like some journalists kind of actually peeked in until the security yeah. guy could take him along. So this is all fake. Yeah. The guy is fake, but also he, you know, he used to, he branded the, the fake news kind of, um, term, right. you know. So it's a fake, fake. Right. And then the funny thing is that the one thing which is not fake is that these folders would follow him. Yeah. And now he has another <laughs> problem with folders. <laughs> and so somehow the guy will be remembered as the president of paperwork. Of paperwork. <laughs> so. He has a folder fetish, let's be yeah. honest, and it's going to probably put him in prison. But of so. course, you know, like what I'm saying, I think that answers your question, but like, you know, this is, it doesn't have anything to do with the figure of right. Donald Trump. It has to do with how he reacts as a probably. I don't know, I never met him, so, but like yeah. it's the, the Donald Trump in our idea, of course, right. is what I'm aiming at. Yes. And it's important to point out, there are, you will never see a figure, there are no people in any of your work. There's only the presence, right. the ghostly presence. You can of show people. Gangway as so you will well, somewhere. Okay. Um, another question for Thomas: Political issues and events are almost always associated in our minds with human beings. Thank you, Douglas. Whether an individual or a group of people, 
In your works, you omit people altogether. How did you reach that decision? And how much does it influence your choice of images? Well, you know, it's a, how do you call these kind of uh, light planking? The things that they seal things on the highway? on the side so you don't fall into the... Oh, uh, rail, uh, guardrails. Yeah, it's yeah. guardrails. So it yeah. is a guardrail, I would say, that, you know, like mm. if, the, a picture can, if a picture can work without the presence of a human being. But it is not the only one and by far. And um, the fundamental question is, so uh, imagine a photograph of a zoo. Yeah. And in the zoo, we are in the penguin department. And they, it's, he sits in something which resembles that structure here, yeah. which is supposed to represent Antarctica yes. in, in concrete. <laughs> in, do, does Jerusalem has a zoo with a penguin? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so which it's is, a really which, which is a <laughs> dramatic thing, of course. Yeah. But now you, you imagine that photograph, and you're standing there, and you photograph the penguin in that surrounding, which supposedly makes him feel home. Yeah. And. Um, then you think about the penguin and how the relation about his environment and how how sad it is that we human beings bring him here to, to ex be exposed and his whole life is ruined and he never sees his pals from right. Antarctica. If you take out the pe penguin, you see the effort of doing that right. in a much stronger way because you don't identify yourself with the misery of that little bird there. Yeah. And that's what I'm after, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not... We, we cannot look at photographs with people and not think about the people right. that's written in our genetic code. That's true. <coughs> uh, luckily, it's in Jerusalem and not in the desert in the south, but still. Um, Douglas, in Little History of Photography, that you said that you read Short History of Photography, Walter Benjamin describes the caption as an imperative director of photographic uh, meaning which uh, creates a signpost for the viewer. How do you understand the ties between the photograph and its caption? In general. <laughs> I'm not sure I could say it better than Walter Benjamin, but um, I mean, you know, you could look at it in terms of um, Lev Kuleshov's idea of, of film editing in, in the, uh, during the Soviet Revolution, the revolutionary kind of cinematic, the idea of colliding, what, you know, the idea of editing in film, and I'll just use this as a metaphor, mm -hmm. putting two images together, they colliding to them together, one after the other, produces a grammar. There's an argument being made, there's some sort of collision and meaning produced. The same image to begin with, and you put a different image after it, produces another thing. So, like language, captioning it speaks to this whole idea of linguistic and visual kind of, I mean, truth with quotes around it, but the idea of pointing or pointing towards meaning. So, uh, Thomas's works with a different title might mean something else. If, maybe you know. we can give the example, I don't have it here, I, yeah. I admit, but uh, maybe we can give the example of the the titles of the Azadin Alaya um, series. Yes. The, the model studies. Yes, the model studies, but yeah, yeah Thomas because will have to speak to that. You should ask Thomas that. It is a joint thing, you know, I keep <laughs> talking. <laughs> I'm Go sorry, I'm sorry. No, they're, they're titles of si singing birds. Yeah. They're American titles, birds. so what yeah. you see, Azadin Alaya is a fashion, uh, of course, designer. And uh, you will see it in an exhibition. Um, <coughs> Thomas photographed uh, his, um, how do you say, cutouts? Uh, no. Uh, patterns. The patterns, sorry. Patterns? Dress patterns. Dress patterns. Yeah. And uh, Which are made out of paper. Dresses? Hmm? Just dresses? Dresses, and, but, uh, but No, dress clothing. patterns, yeah, clothes clothing. in general. Yeah. And, uh, and now you say about the titles. So, no, I mean, at some point I just started looking at other people's models. Yeah. The notion of the model is something which came to my attention for the last, uh, you know, 15, 20 years. But because the model is a, cult a cultural technique which we employ every day and we kind of just take it for granted. Famously, there is in art history the big iconic turn when people, art historians, realize that we don't have any idea of how do we actually read this picture. We all kind of are art historians, but nobody has ever established a grammar for that. What is it like language does? And um, in comparison to that, I think 
the idea, the understanding of models for our daily navigation through the world is even more fundamental and hasn't had so much exposure. Um, I mean, you know, models, uh, the retirement plan is a model, the weather forecast is a model, <laughs> economy is a model, statistics is a model, you know, but the pandemic was famously, suddenly you heard about model lists, which were, right. of course, always there, but we never kind of looked at them. Flying to the moon can only work with a model, because we just need to kind of train of how is it in a spaceship, you know, right. and it's simulation, therefore. Um, but architects, you are you're, architects, you're, you're averse the process. I mean, architects, when they do it, like you're saying, they aspire towards something to realize something. You're doing it the opposite no, way. Yeah, well, no. I also go through the stage of the models with my work here right. to get to the picture I'm after. But mm -hmm. the, so you know, that's the moon landing is done this one, but right. the, um, the travel there is a little is is in my studio, but the. Um, what I wanted to say is like the models as a notion I, th I find also equally interesting as much as my own work. Right. And so, um, and the architectural model is the one and the puppet model is the one which we kind of associate usually, you know, most with models. Like the children's model which is sweet and neat and the architect model which is not neat um, but, uh, but also very misleading and manipulative. Right. So, I thought, like, what about if I photograph other people's models? And I do that on models which are kind of also featuring things which I um, recognize, but I don't use in my own work, because there is no point in going finding my work in someone else's work. So Adelina Alaya is a friend of mine, was, was an acquaintance of mine, and we wanted to do something loosely, as you say that, when you meet at lunch. Um, and then he dropped dead. And then the, um, the foundation called me and said, like, do you want to... Uh, see what's left and stuff, and so that's how it came out. I did also John Laudner models because he kind of famously didn't draw, right. but he made models too, and then his architects would make, make drawings, but so the models was also central. Sana, which you guys know very well here from the yes, academy. Yes, yeah. They work extensively in the office with models, way more than any other architect I know. Um, so that was interesting for me to see, and, mm -hmm. and uh, the patterns itself, Azidin was like a man who was probably the last one who really worked in haute couture with the pattern and the, and the dress as a construction. Yeah. And he only worked mostly for Naomi Campbell because he knew the body so well by the time. And then somebody else would make bigger, you know, the size 36 so, yeah. and 38 yeah. and every confection as they call it. Yeah. But these patterns he made himself and that is very unique, that's not very often the case. And basically, the company is still existing. And when I went there and was supposed to photograph his office or something, I saw this pattern hanging there. And I thought they're so amazingly beautiful. But also, they have, a, they have a, something in there which is the, the dream of a painter. Yeah. Because the, the, the palette is very clear. And it's very strong. And it's very it's aleatoric. How they hang next to each other is completely random. <clears throat> and they all have different colors. You will see that in the show then. Yeah. And I thought like about a about a titling which wouldn't give, you know, which wouldn't say dress number 14 or jacket or pants or something right. because that's rather trivial. And I wanted to open up a possibility to read these things with a with another, not, on, not necessarily anthropomorphic kind of view, but something which you, you see something else being hidden, hidden in there, right. like a bird whistling in the, in, the, in the tree and you don't really see him, but you hear him. Right. And that's why I gave them the... the the titles of um, singing birds. Singing birds. So each one has a different uh, title of a singing well, bird. Well, and then I just kind of looked at singing birds. I, I looked at the photographs of singing birds, and I looked at my photographs. I put them next to each other, and then I tried to find similarities between the physiognomy of the bird and right. some some features on those patterns. Amazing. Uh, Douglas, um, your voice is very present in the exhibition. How was the role of the narrator built, and to what extent was Thomas involved in the text? In which text? In the, uh, in the standard labels. He read them. <laughs> <laughs> you wish. Uh, I wish. <laughs> he said he read them. Um, basically, Thomas said, "Do you know? Write what you want." And uh, I don't know. I mean the. But, are, but since we talked about those extended labels, yeah. you are saying, like, you asked Thomas, who is the ideal 
uh, visitor yeah. or viewer of yeah. your exhibition, the one that reads or doesn't read, but whoever reads, and I think most people, I will try to make statistics, but, uh, but I think most people read the captions, they are beautifully written, and I, and I think that in that sense, you are very present in this exhibition. Yeah, I think I'm trying to, I mean, you know, basically, what, as a curator, my process when I do an exhibition, often the essay comes last, but, okay. and so it's more intuitive kind of a process of working with the artist and going through and, you know, um, someone asked me earlier today about how did you choose the works? Because Thomas has many, many, many more mm -hmm. works that we didn't exclude but did not choose because you only have a certain amount of space in an institution and you want to also make something of a narrative or a story or at least a set of questions. And by the way, every time you install the exhibition, it's different and there's different conversations between works. But there are within Thomas's works different sort of campaigns of types of work. The works that we would call the, um, I've been calling kind of the uncanny histories, the large more politically oriented or, or, or event oriented kind of works. The model studies, uh, what Thomas was just speaking about, his dailies, which we haven't talked about yet, right. and the film work. And um, within that, we knew, and we, I, you know, we both knew we wanted all of these things represented. Right. But then, to go back to my voice, I mean, I don't know, I guess as a curator, you're something of a storyteller too, and you try to organize things in the best way you can to tell a particular story. There's other exhibitions that Thomas has done that have a different kind of right, take different with narrator. a different kind of, yeah, a different narrator mm -hmm. or, or more focused on architectonic or architectural with this project you did at, uh, in Leuven in Belgium right. um, or what you did in Saint Andre. And, and I will also point out that although I contribute words, um, you know, what, when you walk through the exhibition, we work together on how it looks, but Thomas has an incredible sense of installation. And when you see the wallpaper work, this kind of architectural transformation of the gallery spaces, that's very much a part, the space itself is very much part of what Thomas does Absolutely. and brings to the table as an artist working in an institution. But in the end, you know, I'm just telling stories. So it's, you know, you try to convey it was beaten into my head at the Walker Art Center, my first museum. I was there for 11 years by the editors in the, in the design department. You know, they were amazing. And uh, I had been in a graduate program, a th critical theory program for and teaching art history and critical theory for about seven years. And when I got there, they called me theory boy. And they told me that my texts were unreadable. And, that, but, and I also had a mentor who came out of literature and he taught me, uh, the chief curator there, Richard Flood, taught me to, you know, write for a human audience, you right. know, and not write for your graduate professor. So for me, whenever I write an essay, whenever I, and especially with something for the public space, I always try to make it have a poetic twist, but bring in different ideas, try to give some context, but also some insight that might have, a, you know, that an, a, an audience member could put their hat on to like, oh, yeah, and, run, right. and run with it. Right. But not to really close it down, to keep it as open as possible. But I don't be scared, they're really short, like this long. <laughs> they're very short. They're very okay. Short. Uh, Thomas, can we get the next picture, please? The critical theorist Hayden White states that in history events um, uh, are not only registered within the chronological framework of the original occurrence, but narrated as well. Narrative as such does not exist in your works. What aspects of narrativity do take part in them? Well, that's a, it's, it's a simple question to ask, but very hard to answer. Well, that's your task. I'm, you know. <coughs> no, my task is to make the picture <laughs> behind you. <coughs> Excuse me. That's my answer. That's your answer? <laughs> Good answer. <sighs> okay. Next one, last, last question. <laughs> this is what he wanted. Um, and I, I, I gave you the article of Hayden White also. Uh, for the Israel Museum's version of your show, you created a unique work and chose to focus on the very current affairs in Israel that were unfolding during the work of the, on the exhibition. 
A few weeks into the demonstrations in Israel, there were already discussions about who will produce the image that will be etched in collective memory as capturing this time in our lives. How did you choose this image taken at Habima Square in Tel Aviv in the early days of the demonstration? And uh, did you consider other images? Yeah, I have considered many, many images in the process of trying to find um, a, met, uh, a, a good fitting answer for the the question which the commission basically um, proposed to me. And, um, and there was a lot of interesting stuff, but it was never really, um, um, it, it, it seemed to be more like an academical friendly way of like, uh, you know, playing the ball back into your field. But the demonstrations, of course, the tricky thing is like a picture should not have an opinion. Right. You know, then it's propaganda. A picture should not tell you you have to think this one or I'm mean, talking about art now. Right. Um, you have to have that opinion or that opinion. You know, look at any Holbein, it doesn't tell you what you think. Right. But it makes you think and that's what the, my goal would be. Whether this is the right picture or not, you know, the jury is still out. Let's have a right. look. But the um, it is for me a, a battle painting. It looks now as like a battle painting. And like from, you know, we, I said this earlier today, but like it's, you know, like Paolo Cello did these three famous battle paintings and they're really um, quite amazing, not only because we know about these battles from these paintings, which are obviously not painted on the battlefield, right? Um, but also like they have a rhetorical and a wonderful perspective way of organizing the battle by the, the or, the, you know, one of them is organizing the troops, the other one is organizing the other troops on the other one, and in the middle they clash together. They clash, yeah. And so my picture yeah. has like with the flags, which are four, there are five flags on the picture, it has a little bit of the lances and the, and the you know, the, the swords, um, but they don't go in the same direction. Right. Um, the second thing is like the umbrellas have a certain sense of individuality, but which is not so expressive that you just think, oh, this is my umbrella, or like mm -hmm. this is this or that. But like it, it represents something. Mm -hmm. If you in a in a shop and you can buy umbrellas because it's raining outside, um, you buy a you can buy a black one, you can buy a red one. So why you would buy the red one and not the black one is probably coincidence, but probably not. Yeah. And that ambivalence is again what I was talking about in the other work. Um, and then, you know, like the outcome of this is not complete, is of course not clear. And it might be a, a memorial image in five years, like it might be coming, you look back to something which was um, uh, a hopeful attempt but failed, or it might be a symbol of something which actually changed society, changed the course of things, and, you know, uh, basically proved that something like a common will from maybe parts of the society which ha haven't been the same, had, hadn't, haven't had the same opinion before, right. succeeds, you know, but it would be still the same image, theoretically or yeah. practically. We hope for the second option. Well, <coughs> yeah. but that's not up to me to say that. I also want to say really clearly that um, um, I, as you know, like I'm an artist, I make pictures, and I do, I hope that people find them interesting enough, long to to look long enough at them. But what I don't want is tell people um, what they have to think, right. and I don't want to be like Harvey Cartel in a talk show who just finished a film about a divorce, and then it suddenly becomes like a th expert in partner therapy. Right. You know, because that's what actors usually do. It's really n not my attempt to be an expert in demonstrations. Of course. So or like what they for, or can they fail or something. It's not a political talk show. Right. So it needs, to be, it needs to have its own space, the, pi the picture, and it has, it has to have its own f future. So let's see how it works. But it was like, a, you, we mentioned umbrellas before, so for the people which hasn't seen the work, which is hopefully the majority. Yeah. Um, you know, like rain, it doesn't rain that often in Jerusalem, as far as I know. Yeah. So that marks a moment of something coming together where the elements weren't necessarily inviting to do the, so. Whether, you know, an umbrella kind of shields you from rain or something else is also something that you might kind of want to 
think of. And, uh, but it marks a, a moment in time which is not like any other moment. Right. And that's, why, that's when I saw that picture of all the other pictures I, we had on the table, and we had, believe me, we had many. Yeah. Um, I thought this is really, this is just the thing which I needed. Again, this is, you see it and you know that that's what you were looking for. I, I think that in this image, the, the human presence is almost there in comparison to it's the other. I hate to say it, it's full of me, you know. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. We are very lucky for it. It's a masterpiece. You will all see it. Um, I would like to thank you very much, Thomas Demand and Douglas Vogel. Thank you. Um, we invite you all for the opening remar remarks of the official opening. You got the hors d'oeuvres. And uh, then we will go to the, the exhibition will be open until 11 o'clock at night and you're, you're welcome to enjoy it. A question? Yes, if somebody wants to ask a quick question, you can. Audience question, go ahead. I just said you will see Grotto here at the exhibition. Very nice. <laughs> My I remember that the maquette, the cardboard maquette, was displayed nearby. It was the only time where I saw your maquette exhibited by the end product. Is there a reason why you chose to display the maquette that time and at other times not at all? Well, there's a couple of reasons, but the main reason is that every good r rule has an exception. <laughs> and that one sculpture was also is a massive sculpture. All the other things are mostly hollow. And so um, in Germany you have the difference, differentiation between a, a sculpture and a plastic. And so um, the thing is, like, practically it happened that I was working so much longer on that thing, and Douglas has seen in, in the studio being growing, and it was so much more complex and it's, than I anticipated. And somehow, like, I don't want to go in detail, but it is, it, that was really on the, on the edge of being impossible in the end. And, um, and then I kind of I hit all the deadlines I had to fulfill. I had, like, other shows where I promised work, and I knew what I wanted to do, but, like, I didn't get it finished, and then I ha we basically had to work around that thing because it w weighed 36 tons, and was very massive. And we and you can't usually you can throw away a sculpture in two hours, but this one would have taken another two weeks and blocked the studio. <clears throat> and so we worked around, and at some point I missed the point to throw it away, basically. And then I looked at it. We had it behind sheets because like, it was also you know visually quite Im 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 uh, how do you say. Uh, imposing and so so you look through it and it was all like on the same day we finished it because it doesn't fall apart where the, all my other works they kind of basically deteriorate light sun humidity changes and stuff and so I had the show coming up in Venice and I thought like you know why not show the process because like and I have I always had a, had a thought like it would be it's you shouldn't do that it's like more like you know talking about the the rabbit in the hat of a magician, and do you really want to know what's happening in the hat? No, you want to have the magician, you know, pulling out the, uh, a rabbit out of a, of, a, of a hat. And so, but at that point I thought, you know, I, I had been on, a, on, a, on something like this in Dublin. And in Dublin in, is the studio of Francis Bacon. And it has been taken apart into small pieces. It was the first job David Chipperfield ever had, in fact. And he was, as a, he just finished school, and he was supposed to take the whole thing apart and bring it to Dublin. It was in London, as you, we all know. And when you see that, and there is no architectural thing of Tipperfield in there, it's just funny that all of, of all people, the guy who is famous for his tasteful minimalism, had to take apart the, you know, the tom completely trashed studio by Francis Bacon. And then you go in this little reconstruction of the of his place, where there was no window to the outside, just a little window for the, for the skylight. And you just realize something about, the stu about the, his process, which you would never realize when you see the paintings. And that was that men, much of this gestural wiping away comes from the fact that he didn't have any space in his studio. 
And that is not an explanation of what the picture, what what makes the picture so great, but it 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 kind of emphasizes on the physicality of his, of his effort. You know, it's not like this. It's like actually like this because he just has to make space in this little tiny, uh, tiny space, and <clears throat> that kind of touched me somehow. And I thought like, you know, maybe there's something in the process which is quite interesting, in fact, and probably I can make it productive if I do it once, because people like you would remember it. It's like, I think it's like 80 years now, 18 years now. No, but it's a long time ago. And so the few people which would see it, they would, they, you know, they would not forget that thing. And so, and now it's actually in Milano, in the basement. We build a basement for that at the Fondazione Prada. You can go. It's not advertised, but it's open. And um, the whole show is there now for, you know, until they close. But the... Uh, um, that was the idea about that, showing that thing. And we did what we did and what I did also and what was important, I think, was not to have a chronological thing, not to show, you know, like I showed, in, in that show, I showed first the picture and then all the things which, which were necessary for the picture, like making the sculpture, the, you know, and that was going from, uh, from Kurt Schwitter's, like a, like a Dada, the, the sixth Dada, Dada pamphlet, writes about a grotto in a, in a living room in Amsterdam, and if that is not Dada, what is Dada, he, said, he writes. <laughs> to, you know, to Kubi, of course, and painting grottos, and then, um, you know, the, the Playboy grotto, and all these kind of references you can kind of come in cultural history, history come up, uh, across, but also a collection of 400 postcards of grotto. And uh, I found that some guy who has 56,000 postcards of grottos. He's a, by, by for surely the biggest collector of that, but also he has some of them are twice, and so I kind of could get them from him. <clears throat> and, uh, and then the real sculpture. So it's not kind of opening with a sculpture and then the picture or something. It is not like a linear kind of idea of like how, how things kind of develop. Be, I, but I thought I, it would be productive to show that once. That's the that's the long story. <laughs> <laughs>